Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now, the kids, when I teach about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's fun to teach. I like teaching this more to teenagers than adults. I'll be honest with you. Adults are too stoic about it. You know, kids, if you tell kids, God has a gift for you, a present, their ears go, bing, like, 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 they sit up, they're like, they're at attention. Gift? Present? What is it? I don't know. Can I, can, do I get one? Okay, what is it? Can, and they're like ready to hear all that you can tell them. Tell me everything. What gifts are there? How many can I have? Can I have more than, you know, can I have ten? Can I... You know, kids don't think like, can I just have one? You, know, you teach adults and like, I'll take one. Like, like, almost like you're pushing it on them. Listen, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are so good. You should want at least ten, but even one would be a fantastic blessing. A gift of the Holy Ghost is the best present you could ever get for your life. And getting it is just the first part. Using it. Using it is where the real fulfillment comes. Because God knows what gift suits you. Perfectly how to give you the right gift for you. And you use it. And then it's it's like life. It's like all of a sudden life is worth living. I mean you get to enjoy life the way it was meant to be. Now. What gifts are there? Paul, he's already been introducing some of the gifts. And the chapter is going to end with just a. A recap of a thought of some of the gifts and I'll, I'm going to add a few more of these from other passages in just a minute but let's read this together it says here in verse 28 he said God has appointed in the church first the gift of apostleship there's apostles and second there's prophets third is teachers then there are miracles and then there's gifts of healing there's the gift of helps administrations various kinds of tongues or languages spoken now, Paul says, all are not apostles, are they? And all are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? And all are not workers of miracles, are they? And all do not have the gifts of healing, do they? And all do not speak with tongues, do they? And all do not interpret, do they? Now, some Pentecostal churches need to read this in the Bible because have, have any of you heard the teaching that if you don't speak in the gift, with the gift of tongues then you don't have the Holy Ghost? It's a, it's a teaching that was actually, um, you know, in my experience, most of the, my friends that went to the Assembly of God Church where I lived in northern Arizona, they taught that teaching emphatically. If you didn't speak with the gift of tongues, you didn't have the Holy Ghost. Because that's a gift that everyone gets, automatic. If you get the Spirit, you get the gift of tongues. Can anyone tell me, does it say that right here? It says, all do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not... Okay, I have a question for you. What if you have the gift of... I don't pick one of the other ones. Healing. Tim has the gift of praying for someone and they get healed. But he can't speak in tongues. Does he have God's spirit? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just using an example. But I mean, what if you have the gift of working miracles? But you can't speak in tongues. Yeah, You know, when I... When I got saved, and they were saying, hey, you, you know, the Holy Ghost gives the gift of tongues, in the book of Acts, to the, to the early disciples, it says that these guys were in Jerusalem at the time of the Pentecost. That's, what, that's a high holy holiday in Jewish culture. That's following 40, 50 days after the Passover. Now, the Jews would come from all over the world to get to, to Jerusalem, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't like hop a plane and you're there. Can you imagine just, you're going to trek up from Ethiopia to Jerusalem? How many months, maybe a year, to, to travel to get to Jerusalem? And you get there at Passover time. You plan your whole trip so that you're going to be there for the Passover. And then you stay till the day of Pentecost. Because you're not going to just turn around after you trek the con couple continents and then go, yeah, okay, I was here for Passover, let's go home. You stay. You know, like, hey, it's Jewish holidays, high holy time. 
Let's stay till Pentecost. You stay till Pentecost. There's people from all over the world in Jerusalem at this time. And Jesus told his disciples, you guys go wait in the upper room and pray until you receive power to be my witnesses. Power to be my witnesses from the Holy Ghost. Now, what happened at Pentecost? Remember in Acts chapter 1 and 2, and the Holy Spirit appeared as tongues of fire. And it came down upon them, right? Resting on each one. And they went out into the street and they began proclaiming the mighty deeds of God. They're all talking about the great things God did. Except that something curious happened. The people were going, hey, wait a minute. I'm, you know, I'm Roman and, and I can hear these guys speaking my dialect. And, and, and I'm from Crete and they're speaking. And I, I'm from Arabia and they're speaking Arabic. And, I'm, and each person was hearing their own native tongue being spoken. Now, if you don't speak another language other than English, this, well, just think about it. If you were over traveling in Japan and all you hear is people speaking Japanese, but you don't know Japanese, what does it sound like to you? Gibberish. I mean, it's just, it's just noise. You don't get it, so it's just, you see that they're talking, but you don't, you don't perceive what they're saying. But what about the one other tourists that's on the corner going, excuse me, excuse me, does anyone speak English? You know, and you hear them say that. What does your ear do? Immediately it perks up. You go, ha, someone who speaks my language. Hey, where are you from? You know, and you go over to, and you start to talk to them because you, we speak the same language. Can you imagine you're in Jerusalem and all of a sudden these apostles come out of the upper room and one is speaking in Arabic, one speaking in Greek, one... Fun speaking Latin. I mean, fluent. Talk about cheating. If you ever had to learn Latin like I did it in Catholic school, you know that was not really that fun. But these guys are fluent. And they're proclaiming the mighty deeds of God. Now, since I grew up speaking Italian as my first language, and then I learned English when I went to school, I thought, well, I already speak language, you know, Italian, English... Guess which language I pray in. Just curious if any of you could guess this. Yeah, when I wake up and I'm tired, I pray in Italian because that's the default is my first language. Then I learned Spanish when I went to school and in my neighborhood. A lot of we were in Arizona, right next to Mexico, you know, border that a lot of a lot of Mexican folks came across, and so we played. We call it football, but you call it soccer in, in American culture. We play football together. And we would call to them in Italian for the ball, and they would call to us in Spanish for the ball. You know what? When you're a kid, you don't give a rip. You're playing soccer, and you figure out what they're saying pretty easy, just from the context. And then you have one kid who only speaks English, and he's yelling for the balls, kick me the ball, kick me the ball. It only takes a little while till your brain figures out that kick me the ball means he's waiting for you to kick him the ball. You know, you don't even, it doesn't matter if you're saying it in Italian, in Spanish, in English, you just figure it out. But when the kid that would join that didn't speak the languages, we could always tell. Because he'd be like, deer in headlight, you know. What? I don't know. What, who, what, are you, what are you guys talking? And that weird, puzzled look, you know, like, we don't get what you're saying. These guys went out and proclaimed the mighty deeds of God. And because of that, because of that day, that first day of, of Pentecost, the, the church began to, the, the, some assembly of God churches and other sects of Christianity have held to the fact that you must speak in tongues as an evidence that you have the Holy Ghost. Yet Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's saying, not all have the gift of tongues, do they? And not all have the gift of interpretation of tongues. You know, some have the gift of to speak the language, some have the gift to interpret the language. It's two different gifts. But Christians are weird. They're like, that guy can do it and I can't. Instead of rejoicing that they have someone that has the gift of speaking another language, or they have someone that has a gift of interpreting the language, they're all jealous. Well, that's not fair. Why don't I get to do it? And uh, you know what the sad thing is? is they think that that's a measure of God's Spirit, that whether you have God's Spirit or not. What if you have the gift of prophecy, but you can't speak in tongues? Now, we're not going to do this today, but coming up, when we get to, in, in just, a, just, next week is 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. 
And, and, and then comes chapter 14 where we're going to learn what is the greatest gift of the Spirit? Does anyone know? The greatest gift. Not love. No, the greatest gift of the Spirit. Uh, I'm talking the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Love is, love is a fruit of the Spirit, we're told. Remember Ephesians 5? The fruit of the Spirit is love, right? Peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are fruits of the Spirit. You can have, by the way, you can have fruits of the Spirit and not have gifts of the Spirit. There, there are some people literally bearing fruit for, for the Lord in the fruits of the Spirit and don't even know about the gifts of the Spirit. It's, it, it's, it's ironic. They, they don't know that there's actual gifts on top of the fruits. And they, they, I think, oh, you know. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. And you will prove to be my disciples. Did you know that using the gifts of the Spirit don't prove you're his disciple? But you yeah. can use them. And the greatest gift in, in 1 Corinthians 14 is the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. More is considered the highest gift of all the gifts of the Spirit. It's the gift of prophecy. Now, why is prophecy the greatest gift? He said here, first is given to the church, apostles, then prophets. He's not saying the importance. The importance of the gifts will be found at chapter 14. Chapter 14 will say that prophecy is. Why? What's the big deal about prophecy? Yes, what, what is a prophet open with? Thus saith the... Who? Lord. The Lord. A prophet doesn't say... Thus saith, uh, well, the Izzy. you know, the Izzy or the <laughs> Pete or, you know, it's not us saying what we think. And by the way, most people really don't give a rip what we think. They, want, they, they come wanting to know, God, what do you want for me? Show me what you have for me. And the Lord goes, okay, I will. But he'll use vessels like us to speak through. And... Guys, you don't want to falsely prophesy because what do they do to false prophets? You know, they stone them to death. Yeah, this is not a this is not something like you fool around with. Well, I think I'll say in the name of the Lord, don't ever do that. This is one of the most serious gifts, the greatest gift, but it comes with great consequence if you don't use it correctly. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. You know, I hear say something. So, so the greatest gift is this gift of of being able to say. And gosh, wouldn't it be great to have someone in your in your group that has this gift of prophecy when you're struggling, going, God, I just really need to know what you want me to do. And, and the Lord goes, oh, don't worry, go see Aaron. He's got the gift of prophecy. He'll, you know, and, 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 and you go, Aaron, does the Lord have any word for, you, for me from you? And he's like, yeah, the Lord told me, thus says the Lord. You need to stop worrying about that thing and let him take care of it. And, and you're going, how did he know? It's nice to have a, pocket prophet in your group, right? I mean, just, to just just happen to have one of them handy, you know? Just somebody gifted with that gift. I mean, what a cool gift to have around you. But, if someone really has that gift, I found this out, that there are there are petty Christians that will be jealous. Because they have the gift of prophecy. And, well, I can only speak in tongues. Man, but every gift you have, what are you supposed to do? Use it. Use it. It's what? It's the gift of everybody. Yeah, it's a gift Everybody's for everybody. Gift. It's to help build the body mm -hmm. of Christ. All these gifts are to build us up. Now, this isn't the exhaustive list. I mean, if we go to Ephesians 4, verse 11, Paul adds pastors to the list. Pa pastor slash teacher to the list. And he adds another gift, evangelists to the list. That's a gift. Now, not everyone is called to be an evangelist. Like Billy Graham was an evangelist. Greg Laurie is an evangelist. Those guys have a gifting from God to present the gospel in such a sweet way that that lets people know, hey, you're you're perishing. You know, you're like you're like in a storm and in a stormy sea and you're drowning and you need a lifeboat. You need a, someone to come up with a lifeboat and throw you the life preserver and save your life. And that life preserver is Jesus. And in this storm of this life that we go through, if you don't get if you don't reach out and grab that preserver, it's being offered to you. But you have to choose to grab it. Now, that's an evangelistic message. I can do it because I'm a pastor teacher. But I'm, you know, I, I find I lead more people to Christ just teaching them than I, because I, I'm not really, you know, I don't do an evangelistic message every week. Some guys have that gift, though. They can present that gospel message over and over and over. That's a gift. Truly a gift. But I don't, I don't go, man, I'm jealous of those guys. 
I rejoice that God put those men in the body of Christ. They're really cool. And I've shared this before, but don't ever mix up the word evangelist with the word witness. In our culture, unfortunately, some people use them as synonyms. They, they think they're the same. And so they say, well, we all have to be witnesses. It, it says we all have to be witnesses. And, and, and they put witness slash i.e. evangelist. No, it says witnesses. Witnesses in Greek means to be a showing of Christ. You need to show Christ through example of your life. All of us are called to be a showing for Jesus, right? I mean, in whatever gifts we have, whatever things we do, we should all show Jesus to the people we're around. But that doesn't mean we all have to go out corner on the corner and yell, Hey, everybody! Get saved or you're going to hell or, you know, whatever your picture of an evangelist is. Dude, that is the worst thing. Some churches actually force their members to go evangelizing. Door to door, handing out. And the people, they look so nervous like yeah. <laughs> wet rats. Here, I have something for you. It's not even their calling to be doing that. If it's your calling, God will bless you and do that. If it's not, best thing you can do is what? Stay home and use your other gift. <laughs> Maybe that one isn't your gift. Don't even use that one. Use the one... By the way, it really helps when the parts of the body do the part they were designed to do. You know, I have these really cool little things above my eye here, attached to my eyelid. They're really delicate. I call them eyelashes. And they're, they're, they're part of my body, designed by God, very very perfectly placed and there's nothing wrong with these little buggers doing their job as long as they stay where they're put to be I mean it really I want to emphasize this when it comes to having whatever gift you have you need to be in the place where you use your gift and you make sure you do just what you're designed to do because if these eyelashes stay where they're supposed to be they're they're like really good at at Catching stuff before it hits gets into my eyeball. They kind of help sweep the stuff, you know, that, that stuff, dust coming down. They, they, you know, I don't even know how they, they can blink so quick and keep stuff out. And they're great. The only problem I ever have with my eyelashes is if they don't stay where they're supposed to stay. You ever had an eyelash jump ship and go in your eye? I mean, into the eyeball. Not, not on the eyelid, but it somehow jump ship and went in. And you're like, ow, what is that sharp little pain? Is it? And it's weird that something that is designed to be so close to my eyeball, by God's design, when it gets out of place by just a, just a, what is that? Like a fraction, not even, you know, a, 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 a millimeter away, it gets off base and goes in the wrong spot. How much pain can it cause the body? A lot. I literally have had to pull over driving and thought a bug must have got in my eye and then when I get pulled over and I get the, the mirror and I'm looking and I got the glasses I'm, that's not a bug an eyelash somehow decided while driving down the road to jump ship and go in my eyeball and and I'm like oh oh ow, oh yeah little what I thought there's a and I was sure it was a bug isn't it weird that a part of the body made by God just in the wrong place can cause such pain. And what's even worse is another part of the body going, I'm jealous. <laughs> Those eyelashes are always right there above that eye. I want to be close to the eye. Can you imagine if my, my big toe said that? I want to be an eyelash. That would look a little weird. Big toe moved in place and said, scoot over guys, I want to take over this. Vision would be impaired, wouldn't it? The body would look really funky with a with a big toe flipping up and down on the eyelid, you know. Now, I only use this example because sometimes some of you are jealous of other parts of the body being where they have been placed by God. And you're going, I want to be where they are. Don't do that. It's a trap. You are designed by God to be where He puts you. And He has perfect placement. He knows how to put certain parts of the body together in ways that comprise something beautiful. I mean, he puts, he puts all of these fingers on this hand 
and, and I've used this example before, but literally, he has put all of these fingers on this hand, and all of these fingers on this hand, and all of these toes on this foot, and all of these, and you know, I heard in Christianity, they have these things, they call them clicks. Yeah, I, I heard, they, someone went to this other church and they said, you know, Pastor, at that church they have these five people and they always hang out together all the time. They're always together. Isn't that horrible? And I went, hmm, let me see. Those guys have been together 54 years. Those ones have been together same amount. Seems like pretty long. And the, and the, and the, these ones, yeah, they've been. Uh, and the, wait a minute, is this a problem mm -hmm. in the body that these five digits stayed together for all of my life, and those five have been together, and those five? Is it a problem in the bo in our physical body if the parts stay, if those toes stay with those other toes their whole life? There's not a problem. The problem would be if one of those toes decided to move up here, like on my upper lip. <laughs> and my nose would be smelling them all the time and be like, this is not good. You guys are meant to be down there in the shoe. Stay where you're meant to be. See, the part of the... the and I know it's, I'm making it comical, but it's to make a point. Some of you get jealous that you're not in a different place than God's put you. That's not the correct answer. The correct answer is... Why aren't you rejoicing when the other member is, is honored? You should just be going, all right, because we're all one body. If one person gets honored, if Steve gets blessed because someone really liked his music on the radio <coughs> with, with, with their spy hunt, and they put a lot of effort into that, I, I don't go, I'm jealous. He gets all the recognition. You know, they wanted him at the Harvest Crusade. Did you know that? <coughs> to play with Greg Laurie and the Harvest He's going, we're studio musicians. We don't do that. We don't do that, you know? I'm going to do it anyway. But do I go, I'm jealous? Or do I go, I rejoice? See, if you have the right perspective, you rejoice. And if you see God put certain people together and they're always together, don't be jealous. There's a reason. Maybe they're five little stinkers. You know, and you're thinking, and if you join the group and you're a, and you're a left nostril or a right nostril, you might not get along with those five stinkers. <laughs> not good for you. But those five stinkers can stay. Those toes can be together their whole lives, and they're just happy as can be. They work well together. And they work well together, and they do the job they were made to do by God. In the body of Christ, God composed the bodies in such a manner that sometimes. Some people are meant to stay together their whole entire Christian experience. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, what about the, the one who's called by God to be, uh, I don't know, one of those life-giving blood vessels that pumps through the entire circulatory system and carries oxygenated blood down all the way to the toes, comes looping back. What if you're one of those blood cells that, that just rut, literally gets circulated all the time through the body, constantly Pumped back out, filled back to the heart, lungs filled with more oxygen, sent back out, go out to the to the extremities, and come back again, right? You, you give off what you're supposed to give. Do you know that in the body of Christ, I believe some some people, they, they to others, they're like, I don't get that person. They float from here over to there, over to here, over to there. I said, they're just part of God's circulatory system. They breathe life. They bring life. They... They drop off that oxygen that's needed in that spot and then they return back. Get re-oxygenated and sent back out. And some of, some people just can't seem to literally take the example that the Bible gives that we are just parts of the body of Christ and, and recognize even, yeah, so some parts aren't glamorous. Paul went over that. The liver, the kidney. I said the gizzards. I got in trouble. Hey, afterwards was corrected that we don't have gizzards. <laughs> Chickens have gizzards with little stones to break down. Sorry, I was trying to, I was thinking farm example and I said gizzards and I shouldn't have. Everyone was laughing. I thought, oh, was it that funny? I didn't know I said huh. Yeah, okay, I got it later. No, I was like, we don't have gizzards, honey. Okay. But whatever port you are, what if you are the kidneys? 
What if you're the lungs? What if you're the part? I mean, you may not be ever seen in the body. Are you important to the body? Oh, yeah. You know, those parts that we don't see are the parts that are really necessary for life. There are people in the church that you'll never see. They're behind the scenes. They're doing the work of the Lord. And they're never seen. And, and you know what the sad part is? They don't always get esteemed the honor that they're due. Because they really... I mean, honestly, the body of Christ I don't think would be healthy like it is without those people that are behind the scenes doing those things. We just... You know, it, it, it's weird because in our culture, it's more of a personality cults. It's more, you know, the pastor. Who's the guy in the front? You know, what's the the ministry? Oh, is it this person or that? It's not. It's supposed to be about Jesus, and we're just his body working together. The pastor is just there to equip us for the works and callings in our lives. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website amazinggracekona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's amazinggracekona.com. Mahalo and God bless.